Good morning from Stanford University. My name is Will Chu. I'm the faculty co-director of StorageX Initiative here at the Precore Institute for Energy. And joining me today is uh, Professor Itui, the director of the Precore Institute. And we're delighted to have the kickoff of our spring quarter StorageX International Symposium. For those of you, uh, our academic listeners uh, who uh, had, uh, 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 I hope you all had a good spring break and ready to resume. And we have a very exciting lineup of speakers, uh, which I will overview at the very end of the seminar today. So we have already spent a number of our sessions on a very important topic, which is long duration storage. And I'm delighted that we'll be continuing the topic today. Let me just quickly review what we have covered so far. We have heard from Bob Laughlin and Andrew Ponek from Entora Energy on thermal storage. We heard from Mike Aziz uh, at Harvard University and George Crabtree at Argo National Lab on new chemistry for long duration storage. On the industry side, we also heard from Marco Ferrara at Form Energy, Andrea Petteretti at Energy Vault, and Jor Henneman at Enervenue, who talked about a variety of energy storage, for example, through mechanical energy and highly reversible chemistry. To continue this excellent series of seminars on long duration storage, joining us today um, is our very own Steve Chu and Paul Albertes from the University of Maryland. So we're gonna have uh, Paul talk about the technoconomics of long duration energy storage and there could not be a better person to do this. Paul is currently the Associate Director of the Maryland Energy Innovation Institute. And he's also a faculty member in the Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering Department at the University of Maryland. He initiated the landmark long duration storage project at RPE at the Department of Energy uh, called DAYS. And he was also additionally responsible for the Ionics program that oversaw the development of novel solid electrolytes, both of which have implications for energy storage. Paul, we're delighted to have you join us today. We're looking forward to your talk. Great, thank you so much, Will, for the introduction. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I really enjoyed some of the past, uh, past sessions uh, as well. So my, my talk today, uh, titled Stationary Electricity Storage, uh, Daily and Beyond, and uh, let's jump right into it. So I have three major topics for today. First is uh, some context and scales for stationary electricity storage. Uh, the second is some, I think some persistent challenges that commercializing new stationary storage technology faces. And I think it's important to be clear about those and, and understand the history of what's happened in this field, uh, especially if you wanna make some changes going forward. And then third, um, talk about the topic that, that we'll mention in particular, uh, long duration, which in the context of the RP days program and the a paper I'll be talking about is between roughly 10 and 100 hours uh, um, of storage. And I'll have some definition and motivation there and then it's also some techno-economic analysis. Okay, so it's always good to start with the problem we're solving and what are some options or alternatives. Um, really the big, big opportunity is in decarbonization for, for long duration storage. Uh, there's a variety of wedge type diagrams like this for decarbonization showing how CO2 uh, can go down over time or, or greenhouse gas equivalents can go down over time. Um, of, I think most of these typically identify the two biggest chunks of this would be in the content for electric electricity decarbonization and then also fuel switching, things like uh, electric vehicles, so oil to electricity or, or electrified heating, things like this. And so these are really big, um, the two biggest wedges. And there's a variety of ways to, to address these, obviously scaling up nuclear, uh, scaling up carbon capture and sequestration. Um, wind and solar and other renewables are, are a big one here. Um, improve, increasing um, deployment of wind and solar can be done by uh, accepting higher curtailment rates, uh, transmission expansion, load flexibility, and then finally storage, which I'll talk about in particular today. I think it's not controversial um, to, to state that uh, you know, pushing wind and solar along with storage as far as we can is, is a highly desirable option and one that, uh, 
that should be pursued. Even if we don't believe in a 100% wind and solar version of our future, um, pushing them as far as we can. And so that's why this topic of, uh, in particular, long duration storage is an important one. So I want to put some uh, visuals up here on the scales of stationary storage. So if you look at battery storage, it's about 0.01 terawatt hours worldwide today. It's growing. Um, this is a relatively early stationary uh, lithium ion project in California. If you look at um, storage in, in molten salts or in other kinds of thermal storage, uh, this is in particular for concentrated solar power. You can see here the two tanks that are present and um, where the salts are stored. This is about three times current batteries, uh, about 0.03 terawatt hours. Pump storage you know, vastly exceeds either of those. It's about 1.6 terawatt hours worldwide. In the US alone, it's about a quarter of a terawatt hour. But if you look at all these methods, which are for electricity storage in, in one way or another, they're really dwarfed by what we have for the, in the existing uh, uh, fossil uh, storage that, under, that underpins the current electricity system. So in, in the US alone, there's about 1,200 terawatt hours on a primary energy basis for natural gas storage. That would supply the US grid uh, completely for multiple months. Of course, that gas is also used for other applications like space heating, but that gives you a sense of the scale of what's going on. On-site um, store or on-site uh, for coal plants, typically weeks to a month of coal is stored on site and nuclear might store even multiple years of fuel on site. So that's the kind of long duration uh, fuel system behind the existing grid that we have today. This single facility actually is located very close to where I grew up in Michigan. Uh, it's, a it's one of the largest natural gas storage facilities in the, in the United States. That facility alone is 27 terawatt hours on a primary energy basis. One other number relevant for scale is if, if you wanted to time shift roughly 10 hours of the US average electricity, that would take about uh, five terawatt hours of storage. So this is you know, three or four times bigger than all the pump storage in the entire world today. And so if you think about you know, a project lasting 20 years, um, that would be a market that might be around a quarter of a terawatt hour per year which might seem very large. On the other hand, this is probably 10 or 15% of the projected um, uh, supply of lithium ion in, in 2030 for automotive alone. And so it's big, but it's actually not totally um, inconsistent with the scales of lithium ion that we expect. I can also mention that if you add up all the storage mandates in various states in the US today, you basically get this number here, about 0.01 terawatt hours. And so uh, this, this gives you kind of a quantitative context for the scales that we're talking about. Okay, so the second topic I want to mention um, is some of the persistent challenges that we that people have faced historically for commercializing new uh, stationary storage technology. So if you look at um, one of the big challenge areas is that there's really good alternatives for new storage technology. So natural gas peakers are proven, um, bankable, unlimited duration, fully installed for under a dollar a watt, about seven fifty per kilowatt. Uh, natural gas combined cycle similar, but they're also you know, over 60% efficient, and they're a little bit more expensive, but not dramatically so, about a dollar watt fully installed. These are really good alternatives um, if we don't take into account, you know, trying to achieve decarbonization. There's a variety of market structures and barriers for storage. Um, there's a lot of discussion there. It's, things are shifting in that front. Um, another challenge has been that the electricity industry is just a tough market. Um, the assets that are desired are technically mature, bankable, low cost, and large scale. This is not a consumer market. Um, and so this is a, has been a, a challenge. Um, the first markets that are present, you know, typically just aren't big enough to scale. So things like backup power, microgrids, demand charge reduction, there's just not, hasn't been enough cumulative money in those first markets to make it, make it to larger markets. And there's also another reality of stationary storage is that there's dozens of physically valid approaches that also that pass like a first, first pass techno-economic analysis. And that's probably diluted investment, um, both in public sector and private sector, and potentially contributed to us not having, you know, uh, a storage technology for stationary that's really scaling up quickly right now. And this to provide, oh, and, and this is a, a figure I like. Um, it's amazing how fast history changes sometimes in some of these things. Uh, this is actually a slide from IHS. Um, incidentally, it was published five years ago, almost exactly to the day. And it shows uh, installed capacity versus technology maturity for a variety of classes of, of storage technologies. And you can look at the list of companies that's here, and you can see some are certainly still around, some are, are no longer around uh, five years later. Uh, a variety of other things like zinc-based batteries, flow batteries, still under discussion. 
Um, and there's also some things that I think in a way have reached technological maturity. So sodium sulfur, sulfur batteries, for example, are a technology primarily developed for grid um, by NGK. Uh, they're now, if you look at as of today, about uh, 0.6 gigawatts of cumulative installation there. Um, and there's other things that have become mature, but are really not making it uh, a significant wave on the grid. So the biggest thing that's changed the last five years is that lithium ion has really broken through uh, into large scale grid applications. And, and that's, uh, we'll talk more about why that's happened. But I think uh, as far as I can, I can tell, a significantly new electricity storage technology that was really, that's really specifically developed for stationary use has never been realized at above gigawatt scale. I think we need to be clear about that. Uh, there's been you know, really dozens of companies that have, have tried this and it's a really hard problem. And I think if this is gonna change going forward, um, there needs to be some strategy put in place to make that change happen because um, it's, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be uh, particularly easy to, to do. Okay, so let's put some numbers on, on how the history of lithium ion, which might give us kind of a quantitative sense of what might, be, what might be required to bring a new stationary storage into commercialization. And so this is, uh, shows the first uh, approximately 20 or so years of lithium ion history. Lithium ion was first commercialized in 91. Uh, Portal Electronics consisted of its early years and certainly is still a big market. There was probably about $75 billion of cumulative revenue for lithium ion prior to the introduction of the first, let's say, iconic electric vehicle, the Model S in 2012. That's roughly how much cumulative revenue was, was, uh, was present. And then this directly contributed to the development of the first lithium ion storage projects. Here's one picture I showed earlier in California um, of lithium ion installation. This directly used automotive lithium ion cells from LG. And so there's a, a clear history here between cell technology for portable electronics cell technology for, for, um, for vehicles and, and pack technology, and then how this ended up on the grid. So it's really, the grid's like the third customer in a way for, for lithium ion. And let's put even more numbers on this. Um, if you look at the history of approximate cell prices for lithium ion, this figure shows on the right-hand side, the cell cost per kilowatt hour, I should say price per kilowatt hour um, over the first uh, you know, 15 years or so of lithium ion life. We were people were making, you know, selling for thousands of dollars at the start, so thousands of dollars per kilowatt hour at the start of lithium ion history. This came down eventually to the hundreds, um, but there's actually an interesting similar story for vehicle battery packs. So even once you have cells, you know, the kind of thing you put into the grid uh, with the mine installation, there's a lot of uh, probably overlap between pack technology for automotive and for grid. And so you can see here also the, the actual pack prices for a vehicle were also much higher initially. And so there's a lot of cumulative revenue, even early on, that helped to eventually make um, large format lithium ion cells and also pack technology cost effective, not only of course for automotive, but also for grid. And so just to state this with words, you know, grid, grid lithium ion had significant consumer first markets in both sm small cells like portable electronics and also in, in large packs and vehicles. It's also an interesting point that um, there's, this is a case of kind of cross-sector or indirect government subsidies. So the federal EV subsidies um, that have been in place for some time really probably directly help drive down prices for grid stationary storage projects. Again, because of significant overlap between automotive, um, both cells and packs. And so, you know, what's going on quite a few times historically is that there's been a situation like this where a new stationary storage technology has exciting research, spin out development, demonstration, um, different kinds of projects have different uh, costs for development and demonstration. So I put a few air bars on here, but historically it's been pretty challenging to, to make it over this deployment wall. And so, you know, I think if, if we are gonna develop and commercialize a new storage technology, uh, there's some important questions to address. There's, there's a number of technologies out there that target a range of durations. How should support be structured given that situation? Um, who will support demonstration projects when there's still technical risk remaining, especially if the projects really are best done at large scale? There's turbines involved or other kind of large scale um, pieces of, of mechanical or other equipment. And then finally, what, what policies should be put in place to support new storage technology deployment, especially early phase? As I mentioned earlier, there's some storage mandates out there, but again, if you add it up, it's basically you know, tiny compared to the scale of 
the overall situation. Okay, so that uh, kind of concludes some uh, little bit more high level type comments uh, and context for this whole area. I'd like to turn next and talk in more detail about uh, long duration electricity storage. And uh, this is again, um, this is the, the paper that we published. It came out a little bit over a year ago. And one point here is, so at RPE, we, we put together a FOA on this topic. And uh, I think uh, this paper really represents a kind of second version of thinking behind the, the underlying techno-economics behind this problem statement. So I think I would strongly recommend this paper over the FOA. Um, I think we want to not correct exactly what's in the FOA, but kind of put the next level deeper thought behind this problem statement, um, even after the FOA came out. Okay, so first off, of course, let's define this. Um, what is long duration? People use that in many different ways. Uh, it's always good, we need to have numbers on it. So we chose for the context of this paper and the day's program, it's approximately 10 hours on the lower end. That's approximately the upper limit for shifting energy or electricity within a day. Uh, there's a lot of value in that. There's a lot of existing effort. And so we were kind of bounding that on the lower end. And then at the top end, we chose 100 hours, um, you know, a little bit looser, let's say low hundreds of hours type uh, duration. Uh, we'll see this does provide some substantial smoothing of wind or solar. Um, but it's also not seasonal storage, which is probably a, a separate problem. The other comment I'd make is that, you know, based on our analysis, the thought was that once you get up to 100 or a couple hundred hours, that's probably the upper limit of being able to economically do anything that involves a container, where you actually put something in a container, ship it to a site, and deploy it as a stationary storage uh, project. And so that's, there's also that reason, and we'll get into that more as we go along here as well. So here's kind of the visual version. I think uh, Andrew Ponick showed a version of this for Cal ISO um, uh, in an earlier talk. This was one that we had put together, I don't know, five, almost five, four or five years ago in the context of days. This is for wind output in Texas. So if you look at one hour time blocks, it's all over the place between approximately zero gigawatts and 15 gigawatts. And then if you increase this big blocks and average it within those blocks, you can see eight hours, it's still pretty close between zero and 15. If you look at 24, it starts to tighten up a little bit. At 72, it's definitely gotten tighter. This is 168. And so if we just kind of color what that looks like, you can see that you know, roughly at 100 hours, you know, low hundreds of hours, there's, there's substantial smoothing even of a resource like wind. Um, and obviously how exactly this looks will depend on whether you talk about wind or solar, a mixture of wind or solar, what exactly the location is, et cetera. But this is kind of the semi-quantitative version of how we ended up with that with that number uh, in terms of its impact on, on uh, enhancing uh, wind and solar or other variable resources on the grid. And we also put together this figure. Um, this is again a kind of semi-quantitative figure. Uh, this shows um, the maximum required storage duration to meet all hours of load. Um, so this is the hours of rate of power versus annual electricity from wind and solar on a regional grid. And uh, this is based on some excellent work from a variety of great groups doing work in this area. There's been some additional analysis published even since um, this came out uh, in the last uh, couple of years. And so you can see here that you know, even 50%, 60%, uh, probably daily is fine. Um, if you wanna get into the 70s, 80s, 90s, that's where you, know, you, you can't really, you're gonna need to have longer than, than daily uh, or intraday uh, storage. And then obviously there's a seasonal problem up here as well where you need where you need months. I should also emphasize that exactly how this looks strongly depends on how much curtailment you're willing to accept, uh, whether you have uh, uh, a broad transmission system and also things like grid flexibility. So this kind of shifts back and forth depending on where you're at on some of those key metrics. I should also mention that if you look at 2019 ERCOT, it's at roughly 20% and Cal ISO 2019 is about 30%. So um, this is kind of the world that the that a couple of particular balancing authorities are currently operating in. Okay, so let's um, and then shift to some more detailed techno-economic analysis uh, of this problem statement and, and kind of think through at a more granular level some of the key ingredients and, and how they play into um, uh, the economics and technical characteristics here. And I know doing math equations at, uh, before 8 a.m. in the morning for folks on the, on the in California on the, on the West Coast is not particularly enjoyable. So I, did, I have a few slides on this. I, I think it is important to kind of get into the weeds a little bit on some of the key terms 
And, and I think we'll see some interesting dependencies and relationships that don't always necessarily jump out. Um, so one thing that we did in our paper is to try to put economics on a full project basis. So there's no like levelized cost of storage or things here. We wanted to basically account for how are you getting paid on the left side here? This is the revenue that you'd make on the right hand side. This would be the various costs that would be incurred over the whole project life. And if so, everything here has units of dollars per kilowatt hour. Uh, if you'd like, if you're a person who likes dollar per kilowatt basis, you can just multiply through by D and um, the duration in hours. And so and that will give you a dollar per kilowatt basis. So you can easily jump between those two if, you, if you'd like. Okay, so if we, if we look first at the left-hand side of this, how, how storage projects are paid. Um, so we have uh, a 20 year project life. We've got a certain discount rate here of 10%. And there's really two key terms here. The first term is getting paid for, for energy, for charging and discharging, um, getting more, getting paid more for when you discharge compared to when you charge. And so Delta E here, this is the price difference, um, which we looked at roughly between five and 10 cents per kilowatt hour. And then also the number of cycles per year uh, that, you, that you achieve. And then on, on the, this payment over here, this is for a capacity payment. So this is a very common mechanism in electricity grids to get paid for capacity, which means you're available to provide output um, when it might be needed. Um, and so this is a dollar per kilowatt year, and then you can divide by duration to put this on the right basis. And there's a few kind of key points here. Um, you can actually see directly from here. So as your duration goes up, if you have say a hundred hour duration, theoretically the number of full cycles you can do per year must be going down compared to if you're doing it, let's say a 10 hour duration. And so when you multiply these things together, your energy payment has to be going down. So we can directly see from this payment here, as duration goes up, your revenue per kilowatt hour store goes down. Um, on the capacity payment, actually something similar happens as well. So if you're paid a certain amount you know, per dollar per kilowatt year um, for capacity, as your duration increases, that also goes down. Um, and so that's both of these terms have a reduced payment as duration goes up. That's really a key dependency here. Um, another point is that we assume that this capacity payment um, is invariant with duration. There's a lot of discussion now and, and various re market reforms being made. What duration do you need to get a capacity payment? You know, we don't really get into that here. You know, how, how this is, there might be a function at some point, different places might choose different relationships, et cetera. But that's another, another kind of very lively and active discussion point. Okay, so look at the right-hand side of this now, the total cost of ownership over project life, there's two kind of really important areas here. This first one is the installed capital cost, these two terms here. And we've divided this, assuming that you have like a power block, like a turbine or a stack, and then separately you'd have an energy block, which is where the energy is stored. Um, and so you can see here, this is the um, cost per kilowatt divided by duration. And then this is the energy cost. And it's important to point out, this is the theoretical energy cost, which means the energy sitting in the tank uh, without any efficiency losses. Uh, so if you're electrochemical storage, you know, this would not take into account inefficiencies on discharge as you convert that chemical energy into electricity. And then we directly account for that efficiency right here. And so you can immediately see that this discharge efficiency is very important because it really directly affects your cost per kilowatt hour delivered, not just what you store in your tanks, but what's actually delivered. The other important term here is OPEX. And really this first one is, is the most kind of important one here. This is how much you pay for energy that you buy, electricity that you buy, that you turn into heat instead of returning and selling back onto the grid again. And so you can see here, this is the number of cycles that you do per year. This is the charging price or the price you pay to buy the electricity from the grid. And then here's a round trip efficiency that's present. And so this is you know, the discounted cost that you have um, for, for turning energy into heat that's not sent back to the grid. And there's some other terms here, details that we don't need to get into, including replacement costs, things like this. Okay, so some interesting points here. So as we, as we already discussed, a low discharge efficiency will impact your OPEX um, here. There's a discharge efficiency in the round trip, but also increases your capital cost of dollar per kilowatt hour delivered, which is what you really care about. And you also have to pay for, for example, heat rejection. So if you have a low discharge efficiency, let's say that you have 100 uh, megawatts coming out of your tank and you have 70% discharge efficiency, you've got 30 megawatts you have to reject 
in heat. Um, and so that also has to be accounted for. That might show up in your power cost. And so this efficiency factors into multiple parts of our cost structure. Uh, same thing for charge efficiency. There's an impact on operating costs directly through actual efficiency, but also again, uh, cooling, but also power conversion. So if you buy 100 megawatts off the grid, you have to convert that to whatever your, um, your storage device uses. If, if only 70 megawatts actually end up in your storage media, you've got 30 megawatts of power conversion equipment sitting around that's not converting electricity directly into your storage media. And so it's really important to think carefully through the economics of these systems, especially if you have different and or asymmetric uh, charge and discharge efficiencies. Okay, one other point that a lot of uh, technology folks and um, don't necessarily uh, appreciate fully is, is that the key equipment costs that folks often think about the most might only be you know, roughly half or a bit more of the fully installed cost. And so every year the EIA puts out um, updates of how much power plants actually cost to build and install. So this is one for uh, 2019. I, this is the latest one they have. This is for a combined cycle plant. This is a gigawatt scale plant. So 1083 megawatts. You can see here, you'd, you'd spend about um, 490 million in the key mechanical equipment. But in terms of your fully installed project costs, it's over a billion. And so the key equipment like the turbines and other kind of key mechanical equipment is roughly half of your fully installed cost. And this reflects the fact that this is a big plant. It's like everyone, this is not kind of a factory, right? This is kind of a built on site. There's a lot of pipes to fit, fit together and land and things like this. And so that, that's, uh, that's reflected here. It's a bit different for a more containerized system like a lithium ion battery. So this shows for a lithium ion battery, 50 megawatts, um, 200 megawatt hours, so a four hour duration. Uh, you can see here the batteries themselves coming at about uh, 40 million and the cost of the fully installed plant is about 70 million. And so here the batteries themselves are, are more than half, but on the order of half or so of the fully installed cost. Um, and so that's important to keep in mind is that there's a bunch of other stuff in these tables that you have to also take into account. Um, and that's important for our thinking about our techno-economics. Okay, so here's kind of the key results from this paper. And um, it's easy to imagine capital cost and kind of talk about capital cost. And so we've isolated just the installed capital cost here. And this includes both the power component and the energy components. Um, and so they're grouped together here. And you know, unfortunately, you can't make a single cost target for this. You gotta make these rainbow figures and look at a bunch of scenarios and things like that. Um, and so let me walk you through this uh, particular case for a minute. Um, so here we're looking at uh, getting paid five cents per kilowatt hour per cycle, um, purchasing electricity at about two and a half cents a kilowatt hour. And then you can see here, we've got two capacity payments um, and then our axes here. And we also have three different durations, 10, 50, and 100. And then our two axes are the round trip efficiency and, and the number of cycles that you can do per year. Okay, so if we look at this, we can start on the left side here. If you imagine you've got something like lithium ion, fairly efficient, you know, 80% or 85 round trip. Um, you, can, you can see here that you might get, have roughly $150 per kilowatt hour um, to, to, for your capital costs. Um, if you have a higher capacity payment, it's more like 200. This is definitely not what with mine is installing at today in the grid, but it's kind of in the realm of possible for sure uh, in the next five or 10 years. And this is a number that a lot of other storage technologies are also um, aiming for, for kind of the intraday world. But you can see that as you go to longer durations like 50 or 100, the money, the, the amount you have for capital cost is now down in kind of the five or $10 per kilowatt hour, maybe 15 per kilowatt hour. Um, so this is really a fundamentally different space than what lithium ion is ever gonna get to. Uh, lithium ion active materials alone are about $40 per kilowatt hour today. And so this is not gonna ever be achieved by lithium ion. You can also see that there's actually a pretty strong impact from round trip efficiency. Um, for this particular scenario here, you know, if you're not at least at 50% round trip efficiency, you're really not having much um, funding for, for capital expenses. So even here you can see there's, a, there's an importance to be above 50%. Um, if you have a higher capacity payment, not as much energy, it's a bit different, but again, you know, there's, if there's a strong incentive to be above 50% round trip efficiency in terms of uh, project economics for this particular case we're looking at here. And the story is a bit different if you have a higher energy payment. I think, you know, accepting a higher, a higher, um, higher 
uh, cost of electricity coming out of long duration storage system is reasonable. You can see here, this is kind of in the low hundreds at 10 hours and maybe in the low tens for a hundred hour duration for this case of 10 cents per kilowatt hour per cycle. But again, if you look out at kind of 50 or 100 hours, this is not anything that lithium ion is going to end up hitting uh, in the future. Okay, so once you have this total amount, uh, total amount that you have for, for capital costs, you can split it up into your installed capital costs or power, and then your installed capital costs for your energy component. And there's a, this is a particular scenario here, the, the first kind of rainbow diagram I showed. Um, and you can, okay, so where would you want to be? You want to be kind of near the knee here, right? Um, so you have a good amount of funding for your energy block and also a good amount for your power block. Uh, lithium ion is somewhere out here, um, might end up a little bit lower, but something like this, the energy costs of, of pump storage hydro and case are, are much lower. I've also got a couple colors on here for um, different kinds of round trip efficiency for something more like lithium ion and something more like chemical storage. Okay, as you can see here, if you're at, for example, 100 hours or 50 hours, the, the cost that you're, the amount of funding you have for your power block is definitely in the low tens of dollars per kilowatt hour. And when you also remember this is installed, um, and this is also theory, not delivered, right? You know, roughly $10 per kilowatt hour or, or below, or well, even below that, five or so, is, is really kind of the place that you'd want to end up to be compelling in, in this kind of uh of, of, of design space. Okay, so what kind of technologies can we look at or think about here? And, you know, this is a figure put together that kind of showed at a high level what kinds of ingredients we, or what kinds of things we might look at. Um, so, you know, obviously lithium ion in this world here, there's other store of technologies that could play well here as well. Um, lithium ion projects can range over a huge range of powers and, and also durations. And there's also obviously chemical storage up here. Um, this is very compelling from, for long duration storage. As, as I mentioned earlier, natural gas is stored this way for you know, enormous volumes um, and, and durations. Um, you know, the challenge with the chemical storage, if it's electricity in and out, the run to efficiency is probably going to be roughly 40% or well below um, 30 even for depending which molecule you're making. And so this is really the challenge for, for chemical storage. And so the question is, is there kind of an intermediate range here that can provide long duration, have a fundamentally different cost structure than with the mine, as we discussed, um, and, and things like flow batteries or other electrochemical technologies, uh, mechanical systems, thermal systems, you know, potentially including both hot and cold storage, which um, Professor Laughlin talked about, um, or including a very, very hot side, um, which uh, Andrew Ponick talked about, and, and others, of course, also. Um, these are the kinds of things that might be able to fit into this intermediate type region. One other comment I'll make um, as we thought about this problem statement is that we can also imagine other kinds of storage architectures. So historically, you know, if you think about going to longer duration, what do you do? You make a bigger tank and it takes longer to deplete whatever is inside of it. There's also a different way to think about it conceptually. If you have a single power block like a turbine or electrochemical stack, instead of a single big tank into which you put all of your storage medium, you could actually imagine partitioning into multiple tanks that would have different characteristics. And in particular, as you go out toward longer durations, that, that, that uh, kind of segment that gets the, longer, the, the most infrequent use has the lowest cycle life requirement. And so you can actually have kind of different attributes of tanks or storage media as you go through here. Um, for thermal storage, for example, you might want to increase your insulation. Um, you might want to store at a higher temperature, things like that, um, in order to uh, help to improve um, some of your attributes. So I think this is kind of conceptually worth at least considering whether this can be designed in a, in a structurally different way. And then uh, one other comment, you know, I think this is important as kind of a first pass check. So if you look at the, at the capital cost of the storage medium and the containment alone, this is a, a good place to get started. For these analysis, so here you are applying the storage media capital cost. This is what you're what's actually storing energy. This is dollars per kilowatt hour theoretical, right? So we're not accounting for discharge efficiency. Versus the storage media capital cost volumetric, so dollars per liter. So diagonal lines here correspond to energy density, and you can see here again if we kind of remember our target of being you know below ten dollars per kilowatt hour, um, you can see that there's some things that that fit in here. Um, but even these are maybe a little close for the, the, the much longer durations. 
Um, and then you can also translate this and just think about just buying a container that can do this. So here, this is just containment capital cost uh, versus energy density for different kinds of standard type containers. Um, and so for example, if you pick water that you have a 300 meter um, head on, the energy density there is well below um, 0.01 kilowatt hours per liter. And so if you, if you come over here to this line here, you can see that um, if you're at 0.01 kilowatt hours per liter, um, that uh, you can't even really afford a shipping container because if we need to be well below um, $5 per kilowatt hour, even a shipping container is too expensive at that, at that cost. And of course, we know that water is stored in large ponds, not inside shipping containers, but this gives you a sense of, of what's involved. One other quick comment here is that it's important to include all the tanks that you need. And so if you've got a storage technology that's four tanks, you know, like, a, like two on the hot side, two on the cold side, you have to include all those tanks in these kinds of calculations. And so that's another kind of point to keep in mind in the back of your head. Okay, so this kind of final takeaways here, uh, this long duration electricity storage topic, especially for, for tens of hours or low hundreds, has really a very different cost structure than lithium ion that lithium ion is not gonna to get to in the future. Uh, we need to really carefully think about some of these technical economic issues, um, impact of efficiency, for example, on project costs, both operating and capital. Um, and then a good first check on this is to look carefully at the energy density, inclusive of all the storage media, and also taking into account uh, discharge efficiency, and, and also the containment. Uh, that's a good first check on economic viability. And then finally, uh, there's some unique aspects of this, of this kind of storage including the very different duty cycle than what you have than, than intraday that could allow some interesting new kinds of, of architectures that could be well suited to this kind of problem statement. And so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, I'll thank Joe Manser who contributed to the, the Jewel paper and the day's program development. And then also um, Scott Litzman and Max Tutman are currently at, at RPE work on this problem statement. Thank you. Paul, thank you very much for that wonderful overview of long duration energy storage. Uh, I certainly enjoyed reading the paper when it first came out. So we have lots of questions from our attentive audience, and I'm just going to try to um, group them thematically. So maybe let's get started on a high level question, Paul. So you highlighted the diversity of approaches being pursued right now uh, for long duration energy storage, and you hinted at the potential challenge of diluting our R&D efforts. Can you speak to a bit more on your thoughts on balancing, you know, making sure we have a portfolio of solutions, but yet we spend enough time to further uh, promising technology along? And there was also a question on your perspective on China, which is um, considerably more focused in terms of its technology roadmap than the United States. Yeah, this is a... So a good good discussion comment. I'm not sure I'm the best. I'm not a policymaker, and um, I, I think uh, I have some personal perspectives, but um, it's a it's a bit of a bit of a tricky issue. Um, yeah, on the one hand, diversity is good. On the other hand, I think as I mentioned, uh, it's really hard to bring a new storage technology to market, and so um, there's kind of two key ingredients. One is you can fund more storage technology projects. Uh, this can be done by the government, it can be done by uh, VCs or other investors, uh, including all the way to the um, kind of large scale demonstration type project. And, and that's important. Uh, the other side of it is the market pull side of it, right? And um, I think, as I mentioned, if you add up all these storage mandates, they're tiny. You know, this is not, it's not significant. And so I, I think at a high level, if you kind of think about balancing those two sides, probably the biggest impact would be to create more pull at the end. And I tried to put a number on this a little bit, like if you look at what the mind, it's not, it's not analogous because some of these systems are very different in their structure and in their physical characteristics, but having 10 years and tens of billions, like that's the kind of number that would be helpful to create market pull and help start sorting out, you know, for the technologies that do make it to a reasonable scale um, demonstration projects, you know, which are the ones that are ready to kind of make it to the next next stage, which which things can a loan guarantee program invest in that, those those kinds of uh, discussions. So hopefully that's a little bit helpful. Yeah, we can definitely discuss this more with Steve uh, after his talk. 
So diving into the details a bit more, um, your analysis really highlights quantitatively on the importance of efficiency versus capex, uh, energy density, and so forth. So that's maybe uh, a focus on a few of those. Uh, on volumetric energy density, you, the plot you make, I have seen it used so many times on the cost of containers. Yet, I think for many of the technologies we're looking at today, it's often mentioned that the energy density isn't that important for long duration storage. And I think your analysis reveals that this is not entirely true. Can you comment a bit on where we need to be in terms of energy density and where we're at right now? Um, how big is the gap that we're trying to address? Yeah, so each, you know, what we talked about just now is a framework for doing these evaluations. So I think um, there's not like a single number. I, I think, uh, you know, again, the underlying idea here was, can there be a containerized system uh, that gets out to the tens or low hundreds of hours and still works? And that was kind of the, the impetus behind this containerization uh, uh, figure that we have. And so, you know, I, I, it depends a lot, but 100 watt hours per liter is probably a reasonable number to have as a as kind of a rough number um, to get much below, and that's so that that really should be 100 watt hours per liter, roughly inclusive of all the storage media, on a on a delivered basis. Um, and so, you know, this is definitely lower than lithium ion. It's definitely way above pumped hydro. Um, obviously, pumped hydro is not containerized. Um, if you can, if you have a solution that's not containerized, then that this kind of number doesn't apply as much. But if I had to pick kind of a rough number, that's that's kind of a reasonable uh, pass. But again, you got to look at the full analysis and where mm -hmm. it's at. In terms of the gaps, it really comes down to there's there's many different technologies out there, and you have to know which one you're talking about and, and things like that. But you know, putting forward technologies that are well below 100 watt hours per liter, especially if it's below 10, it's like you got to really be careful about that. Uh, I mean, the other thing is just um, shipping costs, right? So this stuff has to be physically moved from where it's manufactured to a site, right? It has to be staged on site. There has to be concrete pads onto which this stuff goes. Uh, the lower your energy density, it also scales with pumping, right? So you're, you have to pump more material per unit of power. And so there's a lot of scaling that happens with energy density. And uh, you got to think through each one of those and how that plays into it. Yeah, but I absolutely agree. And this reminds me a lot of, you know, solar, once you get to a certain cost point, um, then the weight really matters, for example, for installation. Um, and I, I'm just quite curious um, that the field, so if you, if you plot, um, you know, the, the energy density being looked at and the cost of storage, I think you'll probably find a, a lot of those concentrated at the um, lower energy density side and lower cost side. And I think I just haven't seen as much on the higher energy density side, lower cost side. I wonder if there's a fundamental limitation to address that part of the plot. So chemical storage is the obvious one there, right? Um, ammonia, you could put in a tank, it would do just fine. Um, other chemical storage, that's a great option. The problem is round of efficiency, right? So, and that, that gets into discussion, like what are we really willing to accept in terms of round of efficiency? Mm -hmm. And that's also kind of a multifaceted discussion. Um, I, there's people out there who advocate the, oh, free renewables, tons of curtailment type argument. Um, I understand that. Uh, you know, that really then gets into like how are the project finances structured and things like that. Like who's really paying for the whole project when there's a lot of it that's not being receiving any revenue at all. But um, that that's kind of the discussion that happens there, I think. And that's a, a good one. Um, you know, there are some other approaches perhaps that can get to very to high energy density and low cost. Um, it's not a huge list, <laughs> and uh, you know, at least based on what I've seen. Absolutely. Maybe let me ask one follow up on, on that, and we can wrap up here and, and go to Steve. In in your analysis, you assumed a fixed electricity cost, or you also accounted for uh, operating modes like load shedding um, in, in terms of time of use pricing. That, that analysis is fixed. So you buy, like in there, it's, it's two and a half cents a kilowatt hour, which is very aggressive. I think roughly the lowest price that that industrial customer must have a special contract, I believe pays in the US today is over five cents a kilowatt hour. So even if your generation cost is really low, people still have to pay transmission, right? Like half of your personal electricity bill is nothing to do with generation, if not more. 
Right? So that that's still in there. So you have to then get into this issue of, well, can we do this stuff like co-located with wind and solar so you don't go to the grid and pay for transmission and come back again? And so I think the two and a half there, we were trying to be pretty aggressive. And there's scenarios in which you're not going to even go that low. Thank you, Paul. I think much more to discuss uh, during the panel discussion. Paul, thank you again for uh, your wonderful presentation. So let me now go to E. Well, thank you, Will. Thank you, Paul, for the excellent talk. Let me uh, invite uh, Steve Chu uh, to the stage. Let me let me do a very quick introduction about Steve, uh, who really does not need an introduction, uh, but I'll just say a, a few things right here. Steve is currently a professor here at Stanford University. Um, and uh, to, to many of us, I think probably all of us, uh, the audience right here, Steve uh, was known to be very innovative and uh, to help uh, uh, generating the uh, exciting program in uh, renewable energy and energy related research. Uh, <clears throat> he, he was uh, in Bell Lab before and then joined Stanford faculty, winning Nobel Prize in 97. You know, after working in the physics uh, for a long time, he uh, also uh, started a program in uh, biophysics uh, and um, later really looking into the clean energy problem. And about 2004 also, he became the Lawrence Berkeley lab director. I personally, how I got into energy has something to do with Steve. Uh, when he became the uh, Berkeley lab director uh, and his speech was so, uh, encouraging and stimulating <laughs> for a young um, person like me. I was a postdoc at Berkeley uh, and later moved to Stanford. And Steve, uh, after spent uh, several years as Lawrence Berkeley lab director, certainly really shaking up the energy program and in the whole Berkeley community later becoming the uh, secretary of energy. Then in the uh, Department of Energy, he launched certainly multiple also exciting activity, including uh, starting RPAE. Uh, so after stepping down from uh, Secretary of Energy position, he come back to Stanford as a faculty. I was uh, fortunate to uh, collaborate with Steve and really having a firsthand experience of uh, brainstorming with Steve, uh, see him how he thinks about problem and analyzing and identify the uh, important problems and oftentimes the solutions as well. And energy storage is one of the areas Steve looked into. And, and today uh, it's uh, very fortunate let us uh, have Steve to share with us uh, what, uh, what's in his mind, Steve. Okay, thank you very much <clears throat> from, for that very kind introduction. Let me just begin by sharing screen. So I wasn't sure who was coming before me, well, immediately before me, I knew, but I didn't know about Andrew Ponce and Bob Laughlin, but that's okay. Um, so I want to talk about energy storage, and I was asked to talk about thermal storage, but I decided I couldn't do that. And so uh, I'm going to talk about thermal storage a lot, but uh, also other forms of storage. Uh, a little note, uh, this is a picture I love, I think it was taken from either the space shuttle or the space station of uh, a breaking dawn over Earth. And the thing I really want to draw your attention to is the atmosphere is very thin. And in fact, uh, most of life on Earth is within a couple of kilometers of sea level. So we live in a really thin little space. I'm going to talk first about energy storage in the context of what's the competition. And here's the competition. Uh, you can think going into the future, as we acknowledge that coal is going to be phased out, hopefully uh, rapidly, but natural gas will be around for decades. And uh, so I did a little arithmetic last night and he said, well, look up uh, one cubic foot of natural gas, how many kilowatt hours, and other unit of energy. And I looked up what the average natural gas storage is in the United States, averaged over five years. It's seasonal. As you see on the right-hand side, it goes up and down. Uh, and you get a very big number. Uh, the amount of natural gas storage 
is, is, let me see if I can get rid of it. Yeah, the amount of natural gas storage is five times 10 to the five gigawatt hours. Then I looked at what the United States consumes on average over a 24 hour period, and it's one times 10 to four gigawatt hours. So it gives us about 48 days of natural storage. All right, let's compare this to chemical batteries. Um, previous speaker mentioned this very briefly, but here we have on the right-hand side from the uh, US Energy Information Administration, you have uh, power and, and energy. Uh, those are the two things that we care about, power, how much power, how, much, how many watts you can deliver, uh, and also how many megawatt hours. And it turns out they're roughly equal um, for a lot of energy storage systems. And what we see is that chemical battery storage uh, at night 2018 is 1.2 gigawatt hours. There's a hope. It's now about 1.8, 1.7. And there's a hope it'll get up to three. So just think of three in the near term future versus um, five times 10 to the five. It's a big difference. So, uh, that's where the competition is. And you say, well, you didn't, these, you know, we're expecting EVs to really penetrate the market. And one of Bloomberg New Energy Finance projection is by 2040, uh, roughly 55% of the light vehicle sales, these are, are cars, pickup trucks, things of that nature, SUVs would be um, batteries. So let's do another calculation. Oh, by the way, I just want to, you know, that sounds very exciting, but it also tells you that 45% uh, of the light duty vehicles will still be internal combustion engines and their last 15 years going to 20 years. So it doesn't look like you'll be an old EV for light duty vehicles uh, in the first half of this century for sure. All right, but let's continue on batteries and EVs. Again, projections. Uh, of what people will be doing. But if you look at all of this, and these are a spread of projections over time, uh, Exxon Mobil, 2018, 2017, uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance is the highest and so on and so forth. Let's take the highest. 600 uh, million EVs on the road by 2040. That's a lot of batteries. And uh, Let's give these batteries a huge energy storage, 82 kilowatt hours, which is the long range Tesla. Uh, typically the leaf is 20 kilowatt hours, for example. <clears throat> and what you get in terms of 600 million EVs, all with the long range battery, a 300 mile range, you're about 1% of natural gas storage. Okay. Let's talk about natural gas storage. Will the price go up? <clears throat> the price um, is not only not going to go up in the near term future, <clears throat> it's actually going to be more worldwide ranges. Uh, in the past, if you live in a country which had natural gas or had access to a natural gas pipeline, your natural gas cost could be very low. The Henry Hub price in the United States is ridiculously low. It's less than $3. Uh, it's hovering around 2 to $3 per million BTU. And way back when, if you look at Asia, you look at the Asian spot market, you look at Europe, uh, it was considerably higher. It was 8 to $10 per million BTU. And so what has happened is the price of shipping liquefied natural gas has come way down. And this, and this is a Reichstag's energy research and analysis they were projecting at this time, 2000, June 2019, what was happening. And the question is, and they said, well, things are going to stabilize after that. But they didn't. And when you go from January 2019 to March, or at the beginning of April 2020, now, by the time you're in April, March of 2020, February, March, April, February, March, the world is shutting down, so all bets are off. But in January, it was not. And certainly in November, December, it was not. And so you see that the prices have uh, come down. So natural gas is going to be a serious competitor for energy storage. 
in the sense that when you really need the power, you can turn it on. But of course, then you need to capture the carbon and you need to sequester it. Um, <clears throat> okay, where are we on non-fossil sources or non-nuclear sources of turn-on energy, which in, in looking forward in the, next, in the coming decades, you think of as just energy on demand is kind of, there's some stored energy somewhere. And if you look at this, uh, you find that 96% of energy storage worldwide is pump storage in 2017. And as uh, already pointed out, the round trip efficiency varies. It varies in what's the height difference. Uh, the higher the dam, uh, the more efficient you get, but it varies between 70 to 85% efficient. Okay, so that's pump storage. Uh, thermal storage is over here and it's down here in this little sliver. And if thermal storage, it breaks out into various things, chilled water storage, just an energy reservoir. You can chill a bunch of water if you have in a build or near a building, a water tank, and you can use that to uh, keep your building cooler, run your air conditioner, or assist your air conditioning. Uh, the most prevalent form of storage is molten salt thermal storage, uh, and that has to do with the fact that you have this uh, solar thermal energy converters that focus sunlight <clears throat> and heats up molten salt. Salt and, and that uh, has a had advantage that it has some storage capability. Okay, if you look in the right hand column, thermal storage in the pink and then in the uh, blue, the blue most of the thermal storage today is used for what we call renewable capacity firming. What does that mean? It means if you have a big solar thermal farm. Um, what you have is you have clouds go over that could wreak havoc with the um, the grid system, if Apache clouds go over and you get to start to get a very rapid um, a rapid fluctuation in the voltage uh, or power generated. And so that thermal, this uh, firming is used in big wind turbines They have a kind of a built-in thing because you have a big uh, moment of inertia in the spinning, but you still have issues there and they're beginning to have localized uh, storage just to, get rid of these rapid fluctuations. And the next biggest thing is what we call time shifting. <clears throat> so for example, in your solar uh, farm, uh, you have peak generation at noontime and peak use of electricity is four hours. So this is the amount of storage we're talking about. It's not, it's not long-term storage that we just heard about. Hydroelectricity in the world automatically has long-term storage, there's all the water in the dam, it's backed up, China leads the world in 2013. And, um, and by 2020, they will have installed, I had, didn't check whether it's true, but they promised several years before that in 2015, that they would add 380 gigawatts. And uh, by 2020 of, of hydro, uh, hydroelectric power, uh, surprisingly, in 2014, Japan led the world in pump storage, followed by the United States and China, but things are rapidly changing. Believe it or not, uh, Taiwan is also uh, pretty high up there. They have a lot of mountains, and, uh, and that's good. Uh, but China uh, has gotten serious with pump storage. And they will become, are the world leader today. Uh, they added about 40 gigawatts uh, by 2020. And um, by 2030, uh, they will have added a total of 90 gigawatts. So they'll be far and away the world leader, perhaps comparable to the other countries combined. How does pump storage work? It's very easy. You have, um, some water up here, which has a lot of potential energy with respect to a little lower basin. You want to generate electricity, you open a valve, you let it uh, turn a pump turbine that has a generator attached to it, and off you go. Modern day turbines are reversible, so if you want to uh, store energy, if you have excess wind or solar, you just uh, take electricity from the generator slash motor, you pump the other way, you pump it up the hill. And, um, 
And so this is an example of what a uh, this water vein turbine looks like, and that's just a variable speed generator. Why variable speed? Because um, you can then have some control over how much power you want. To. It doesn't come it, with the newer generators. You want variable speed because sometimes you don't want the entire amount of power. Uh, but of course, I wasn't showing you the size of these things. Those little things down at the bottom are people. All right. Uh, also, the tubes that carry the water are quite large. There's um, potential for an incredible amount of pump storage in the United States. Uh, we have only using a very small fraction of that. Uh, for example, there's a project called the Eagle Mountain Project. This is an abandoned mine in Southern California in Riverside County. And they thought, wouldn't it be lovely if you can uh, pump water up into this mountainous area? And that's your upper, upper reservoir. You can create a lower reservoir. And then you have pump storage. And um, uh, this is going through a long permitting process. Uh, and there are many people who've resisted uh, this uh, resisted the use of water uh, and essentially even though the state is partially sympathetic there, uh, there's a lot of resistance. I might also add when I heard about financing that um, if you look at the pump storage and you look at the cycles uh, it's different for pump storage. Um, the dams last 50, 100 years. Uh, so we have some dams that are really seriously built in the depression years in the 40s and 50s. Uh, it's a half a century now. And if you maintain them, um, uh, pay attention to them, uh, they will be there for another bunches of decades. Uh, of course, you replace the turbine generators and things like that, which is good because you can get um, more efficient turbines. But here's the thing um, that we don't have a thing for. If you're an investor and you want to invest in something that lasts 50, 80 years, uh, the net present value cost of money is very different. And so it's no secret right in the United States. Most of the dams built in the United States were built with public assistance during depression years, during things where, where they said, this is a good thing, this is true, in the Tennessee Valley Authority, all the dam systems were most of the hydropower in the United States is in the Pacific Northwest, the Hoover Dam and other places that, that uh, the government stepped in and said, we're willing to fund this long-term infrastructure project. Um, this is a report about the cost of pump storage. If you have an existing dam and want to put a small holding pond below the dam, pump storage is very inexpensive. Other people looking in novel ways of pump storage because they say, well, you don't have the mountainous areas all around the world. It's only a small part of the world. And uh, Phil Lubin, it's UC Santa Barbara, is thinking, well, how about using the big vertical depth of an ocean uh, to do pump storage? Remember, pump storage is really uh, converting potential energy to kinetic energy, the kinetic energy generates the electricity or taking electricity going to kinetic energy, which is very efficient, and then uh, using that kinetic energy to pump it back up. And so Phil's idea is you can put little canisters uh, off the coast where you don't have to go far out in many regions, uh, Hawaiian Island, Japan, uh, off the coast of Great Britain, other places, uh, where you can get into deep water pretty quickly. And uh, in these little canisters, uh, you have these little tubes and you're essentially pumping air into the tubes to displace water. And as you displace the water, um, uh, you're actually working on the vertical height of the sea level to the bottom where these things are stored. And so the good news is that takes advantage of a lot of deep sea exploration in oil and gas. Finally, pump storage, you can take a, a salt dome, you hollow it out, and you can, um, and this is how you hollow it out. You just pump in water to hollow it out, and you can use pump storage. Um, 
we have around the world two pilot, what I would call pilot, medium large scale compressed air storage, uh, but it hasn't really taken off. And one of the reasons as you start to pump the compressed air into this, it warms up. Um, as you warm it up, it's harder to compress because the, the pressure uh, is also proportional to temperature. And then when you like, and when you want it, you want to use the compressed gas and expand, it cools down. And so, so step one is you have a heat exchanger. As you're compressing it, the heat goes into some stored pool. Uh, and so you can get a lot more higher density, higher pressure stuff at a cooler temperature. And when you let it expand, you transfer the heat back into the expanding air and that improves the efficiency. Uh, that's adiabatic compression, but it turns out if you really think about it, what you want is isothermal compression. And what you mean by isothermal compression is that if you have a really good heat exchanger, i.e. the earth is your heat reservoir, as you're pumping in the uh, air and it's getting hotter, it throws it into the environment. Seems very wasteful. But remember, you're banking the fact that you're going to get good heat exchange cheaply. And so when you have this compressed air down below and you let it expand, uh, it's taking the heat from the surrounding uh, area and warming it back up. And in principle, uh, isothermal compressed air storage can be 100% efficient, uh, minus the frictional losses, of motors, and things like that. But we al already know from pumped hydro that those frictional losses and the um, finite efficiency of the motors is not bad, but you're getting roughly 80% efficient. This isothermal compressed air storage is yet to be demonstrated, but people are beginning to talk about it. All right, utility scale thermal storage. Um, the driving idea is uh, what Carnot taught us back in the 1800s, that if you want a, an efficient engine, uh, and you're taking energy from a hot source. Uh, so this Q sub H is the heat and energy that you're taking out. Uh, and then you, of course, he tells us you have to throw away the uh, heat, uh, waste heat at some lower energy, T cold. Uh, and so he found that the work, mechanical work you can you actually get of uh, a temperature difference of T hot and T cold uh, that thermodynamic efficiency is given by T hot minus T cold over T hot. All right, so that's the driver for all thermal heat engines. One of the most efficient heat engines are the so-called gas turbine engines. Uh, the gas turbine engine works in the following way. It takes air, compresses it. You inject gas in this section in here, <clears throat> you heat it up, the rapidly expanding gas is then uh, uh, taken out and it spins this turbine. Why all these stages? It's actually quite clever because when you take, go into a, a series of compression stages, a series of expansion stages, uh, you can get something very close to the limit of infinite number of stages you can, and no heat loss out the size, you can get to 100% adiabatic compression and um, expansion, which is great. That's what you want. These turbines work in extremely high temperature and the most efficient thermal plants we have today have a Brayton cycle, that's what this turbine is, and a Rankine cycle, which is a more traditional heat recovery, spin a steam turbine, condense the water, make it go back. A little uh, digression in turbines. I can't help this. This is a modern jet engine. This is a turboprop engine, which actually came before the fully jet engines in commercial flight. And then finally, the engine we have today, which is a turbofan, which is kind of a mixture. It's really a turboprop, but the propellers are now big and they're inside the engine cowling. Uh, and about 80% of the propulsion of a modern turbofan engine used widely commercially is is this, it's essentially a propeller. You use a jet engine, you get this uh, isocentric compression and expansion. 
uh, you inject the fuel in here and out goes the waste heat. These things are amazing. Um, when you're taking this and you're compressing air, you're, you're heating it up. And just as you have to overcome this compressed air storage in, in these underground soil caverns, what you want to do is you don't want, uh, you want to minimize the heat, but mostly as you're heating this up, uh, you're exposing these blades and these blades to extremely high temperatures. And Carnot says, you got to work uh, at the highest temperatures possible. And so if you look at these things in air bleeds and, and, and various uh, things of compressors and in the uh, uh, turbine stage, and you look at the fan blades, it's kind of crazy. The fan blades are actually cooled. Uh, there's cooling air that's going here and they've drilled little laser holes in these fan blades and the air goes in here and it's pulled out from with centrifugal forces and it creates <coughs> a little laminar sheet of cold air that protects the fan blade from the very, very hot gases. Uh, so here's a blow up of these blades. Uh, we first went to single crystal blades of metal uh, that can be uh, laser drilled with holes to create that laminar flow. And as the air goes through, uh, you keep the fine base cold. How well does it work? Well, scarily well. These are the softening temperatures of uh, the best alloys you can come up with. Uh, and the jet engines uh, are running at 1600 C, where you wouldn't dare go above 1000 C if you didn't have uh, fan blade cooling. Um, all right, so let's go back to these wonderful Brayton turbines. The idea here is if you have heat in, uh, instead of injecting jet fuel, you put heat in and you heat up the air, you spin the turbine, it goes outward. The turbine, after the hot gas expands, you uh, it's colder. You throw the heat out in a heat exchanger, just like Carnot told us, and you then recompress it, heat it up, and off you go. Um, if you wanted to think about this in terms of a temperature entropy diagram, going from one to two, you're compressing. And so these compressors can be very, very efficient, as I indicated. So, so that means this is a perfect compressor. There's no change in entropy in, in, in uh, getting up to this point. And then over here, you're putting heat in. And as you go from two to three in this Brayton cycle, you're heating up. Three to four, again, these turbines are terrific uh, because they've got many, many stages. So you, the gas expands and you go down. Again, no change in entropy. No change in entropy is very good. And then finally, in the heat exchanger, uh, you're, you're lowering the temperature uh, and you're ejecting the, the heat. So during this whole process here, you're ejecting cold heat. Uh, that's wasted heat. And during this whole process here, you're putting in heat. What's wrong with this? Well, Carnot says the efficiency is T hot over T cold. But that means if you're putting in heat, remember in his textbook example, now textbook I, example, you have a piston on a hot reservoir and you're putting the heat all at T hot. Whereas over here in real live engines, uh, you're going from two to three, you're putting heat during this whole thing. And so a lot of the heat you're putting in is at a lower temperature over here. So your T hot over T cold is not quite as good. Uh, as you want. Over here, it gets pretty good. All right. So what have engineers done? Well, they said, well, let's run this compressor turbine heat, but we're going to add a little. Oops, sorry. We're going to add a little. So here's the heat in the jet fuel or the thermal source of heat expanding turbine. Normally, you just run it backwards. But <clears throat> now, uh, through a heat exchanger, but now you take some of the heat uh, in an intermediate step and you put it through a heat exchanger, okay? Uh, and so what you have here is when you go from one to two to five to three and around this cycle, you're going up, perfect compression, you're sticking in heat, but when you get to this very high temperature, 
and it goes down, you begin to slurp off some of the heat in this intermediate region. We're not gonna try to get all this heat to dump it as slow as we can, and we put it back in here. So there's a heat exchange mechanism that takes the heat over here and sticks it into here. <clears throat> what does that do? <clears throat> You're, it means that you're throwing heat out at a lower temperature. You used to be throwing heat out all over this cycle, but now you're confining it to a lower temperature down here instead of averaging over this full swing. And the heat over here gets shuttled over here. And so that heat takes you to two to five, uh, which is just kind of taking the hot and putting it over here. And now you're putting in the input heat, H in, at this higher point. So you're getting close to what you really want. Put heat energy in at the highest temperature, take heat energy at the lowest, and you don't want to have these large swings. Well, if this works, you might as well do the whole thing and throw more turbines at it. <clears throat> so you can have intercooling, reheating, regeneration. And in so doing, what you have is now in these stages, if you walk your way through it, you can, as leave as an exercise to the students. Uh, you're dumping heat out uh, going from 10 to one. Where's 10? 10 back to one, you're dumping heat out. You're dumping heat out over here. And this is now, we're, this in the temperature entropy diagram, you're really down here low. All this other stuff has been regenerated due to these heat exchangers. And now you're putting in heat here. And so it gets more and more efficient. All right. Now, let me talk about Carnot batteries. I, uh, I just learned today that you had Bob Laughlin give a talk. And so the basic idea of a Carnot battery is you have some excess electricity. Uh, you're gonna heat, use it to heat up the ground, but wait a minute, if you have some excess electricity or whatever, uh, why not store it in a uh, heat reservoir? The first order of business of storing heat reservoirs, use the electricity and heat it directly into a hot, hot reservoir. But there's something very important that's running through the entire, my entire talk, and that is uh, the conversion of mechanical energy to generate electricity, rotational motion, uh, and going and electric motors is a very, very efficient process. And the, so you're immediately starting to think you don't want to take this electrical energy, stick it into a resistor and heat it up. This is a very uh, high entropy law system. And so it's better to use heat pumps that take energy from cold and hot reservoirs. Uh, because again, the, the electrical motor mechanic, the pump refrigerator of the heat pump is more efficient. So this is the fundamental idea of, um, uh, a Carnot battery, heat battery. And uh, the discharge is some kind of uh, cycle. Uh, people are naturally drawn to the Brayton cycle because those Brayton turbines have become very, very efficient rather than a phase transition cycle like a Rankine cycle. And, um, and then the heat reservoir, uh, there's all sorts of ones. Uh, Siemens looks at uh, storing heat in a bunch of cheap hot rocks. And so they're looking at this. Uh, high power, I'm going to get to in a moment. And then Malta, I'll get to in a moment, which is uh, a new company that's spinning off of Bob Laughlin's idea. His idea is fundamentally the following. You've got hot reservoirs, you've got cold reservoirs. And so there are two essential ideas, uh, new ideas that he's introduced. One is that you want to go to as high a temperature as possible, but then as you go higher and higher temperatures, you run into materials problems. And so he said, well, you know, with existing materials, you got to, and again, you're not going to do all the tricks, um, quite all the tricks that I was just talking about with the current turbines, uh, but uh, you can have your heat stored, no, actually storing hot molten stuff or cold stuff is really easy. You can, if anyone's played with hot stuff, you know that with, um, you know, five or 10 centimeters of um, fire brick, uh, you can be red hot to orange hot on one side and you can hold your hand on the other side. So, so and then it scales beautifully because the heat loss goes as the area of the container 
and uh, the heat energy scales as a buyer. So, so this is good for, great for utility scale storage. So in Laughlin's scheme, he had two cold temperatures, two hot temperatures, uh, and he had a Brayton turbine where, again, the magic you really have to pay attention to in, in this scheme is how good are these heat exchangers? And this cold temperature, for example, if you want to run the thing, you have a hot temperature and uh, uh, you use it to spin the turbine. Um, otherwise, you use electricity comes in uh, to shuttle heat back and forth. Um, so I'm not going to walk through this, but the heart of it is a Brayton cycle turbine, four re temperature reservoirs, not two. And, um, and if everything were perfect, if the compressor were perfectly adiabatic, uh, you can, and the heat exchangers are, are very, very good, uh, this whole thing becomes uh, thermodynamically 100% efficient. And so he... Uh, says, well, you maybe if in realistic numbers, maybe you can get 70% efficiency by maximizing the temperature difference between the cold and hot reservoirs. Again, with a, a, a clever tweaking of, of the Carnot cycle. Um, and so Malta picked this up and they, uh, as in all uh, slide decks looking for money, they show you how important this is when we went from the stone age to the metal age, to the iron age, the fossil fuel age, and of course the storage age, uh, in any case. Um, and in their slide deck, they say, well, look, there's pumped hydro over here. This still remains the biggest long-term storage and highest power. You can have Hoover Dam, for example, can produce a couple of gigawatts of energy. So it's actually out here. Uh, and <clears throat> they think that Carnot batteries would be in this size in here. Uh, the lithium ion batteries are actually, they've made lithium ion batteries that are in this range already, but again, it's the cost that's the problem with these, these batteries. Um, I'm going to talk about something. This is, I cribbed from Wikipedia, and this is cryogenic energy storage. So again, we're thinking of energy differences. And so you can think now of using mechanical, this really good mechanical electricity to compression is a good thing. It can compress air storage and, and Brayton turbines and everything. So this thing comes back over and over again. Uh, and this time, can you use uh, electrical energy to uh, cool something down, compress it, and, and now that's, uh, you put energy work into this and you've got something cold uh, and you've got a temperature difference, which Carnot says, then you can do some mechanical work and then you bring it back up. And so if you look at the, this Wikipedia article, it says, you know, in isolation, this is pretty crummy. It's only 75% efficient. Uh, but if you use 50%, if you use low grade energy store, uh, and if you are near something like a power plant that's throwing energy out, uh, they try to throw energy out, not at 100 C, but maybe 60 or 70 C. But if you have something there, you can boost the round trip efficiency to 70%. And usually when people are thinking of any long-term energy storage and you look at the, eco, the ec economics of that, uh, once you go below 50%, you begin to lose interest, um, as you know, Albertus told us. So this is the high power thing. It's again, power in, you compress it as when you use that, you uh, store the heat in something over here. Uh, and then you uh, refrigerate, uh, you have high grade heat storage over here. This is a cryogenic heat storage, you expand it. So it's a it's again, more of the same of compression, storage, heat transfer, these other things. I have a little movie to explain in more detail. It's not my movie, it's Hightower's movie. Let's see if it works. Air is first cleaned and dried and then refrigerated through a series of compression and expansion stages until the air liquefies. This process is based on the Claude cycle, which is over 100 years old. The liquefied air is then stored in insulated tanks of low pressure. These tanks are readily available from the industrial gases industry 
or a very large scale, the LNG sector. When power is required, liquid air is drawn from the tanks, pumped to high pressure, reheated and expanded. The resulting high pressure gas is then used to drive expansion turbine generators. No fuel is burnt in the process, resulting in the exhaust producing clean, dry air. Waste cold from this stage is captured by the cold store. This is later recycled to enhance liquefaction efficiency. And in a similar way, heat generated from compression during recharge is captured by the thermal store. So that, so that just took you through this cycle. Uh, if it's easier to explain by videos and movies, uh, but it's again, uh, a slightly different combination. Uh, and unbelievably, this looks, this seems to be being looked at seriously by a number of industrial forms. And the, so they're looking at the high tower steam. Um, all right, the last thing I wanna talk about is thermal photovoltaic power conversion. Uh, the idea is pretty simple. What you have is you have um, something, you have something very hot and uh, a thermal emitter, <clears throat> and then you have a PV cell surrounding it. This is taken from uh, 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 Eli LeBonge, Harry Atwater and colleagues. And the idea is that this PV says, well, I'm got a thermal emitter, it gives me black body radiation, but if the thermal emitter is very, very hot, you're moving that black body uh, near into the infrared, uh, so much so in the infrared that you can start to take advantage of uh, narrow band gap uh, semiconductor materials. And, um, and so you design it so that when the light goes and if the light is, um, has high enough energy, uh, so it actually excites uh, an electron from the uh, bounce band to the conduction band. You can you can get your separated charges, and you can you know, slip slurp off the electrons, so you get uh, your current, your photo current. Uh, but uh, what about the infrared light? Well, the infrared light that isn't absorbed is below the band gap. They said let's put a reflector here, and so if, um, and so this infrared light isn't absorbed by imperial, it goes back and keeps the thermal emitter hot. And so uh, in this paper, they showed in this work as you go hotter and hotter and hotter, you're getting pretty close to where you think the theoretical maximum would be, you know, 28, 29% efficient, which is pretty good. Um, very recently, uh, this is, came from an article that was posted in uh, it's a news article, I should say, that was posted um, in February of 2021, uh, where you have uh, energy storage tanks, and the idea is really the same. And now it's molten silicon tanks over here, and the molten silicon is then piped out. Uh, you, where do you put the heat input? Well, the heat input can be come from various things, nuclear, natural gas, coal, well, not really, uh, because <laughs> you want to get rid of the natural gas and the coal, uh, and a lot of people want to get rid of the nuclear. So it's really wind and solar. So anyway, so that you store the heat in here. The idea is you then, when you want to do it, you, you pump it back into these little modules, multi-junction modules, uh, that get to be very, very hot. And... Uh, and you have in these modules, uh, this integrated uh, solar cell, which then says, okay, it only absorbs the light. It's very much the same idea. Uh, you, you just convert it with maybe 30, 40% efficiency. Okay, and there, off you go. So these are some of the ideas that people are looking with uh, because you can't get, you know, I think, people should really look at compressed air storage. Uh, you should maximize all the pump hydro storage you can, wherever you have a dam that's high enough, look to make a small 1% holding pond below their dam, and that would be significant energy storage. Uh, and you've already got the electrical infrastructure, the pump infrastructure. Um, 
but these are some of the ideas um, uh, that are around in looking at energy storage. And with that, I don't know how long I went, but I'll stop there. Yeah, Steve, thank you. This is a really good overview on many, many possibilities uh, right here in, in technology. Uh, there's a question I have, and also I saw the uh, from the audience also have, given so many different type of technologies right there. So how could one go about to analyze right, the use case for each of these technologies? Which one will, you know, will likely to be dominating, you know, depending on the use case? location, how to think about this, uh, this, this problem, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, there's other things, that's a purely technical question, but when you think of siting wind farms uh, near where people can see them, like in Cape Cod, <laughs> if you think of that, uh, then all of a sudden you run into long years to decades delay which costs a ton of money. And, and so that's the other thing that has to be folded in. Why do I'm talking about that? It's because some of these other things, which are much more compact and uh, have a smaller footprint will not have as much resist, public resistance. Uh, the other thing is in terms of use case, you have to decide in the case of heat storage, it scales very well for utility scale storage. So you try to prove proof of principle with smaller stuff, which of course is not as efficient, but that's okay. You, you understand that. Uh, and it really boils down to how, you know, when I look at these things in more detail, it boils down to something very mundane. How good is the heat exchange? <laughs> Uh, very good heat exchange means big heat exchanger, <laughs> which costs money. And so everything has to do with this balance between CapEx. The OpEx, the, you know, the fuel you're going to say is, hey, we're going to assume uh, you're going to get the energy from surplus energy. It's energy storage, right? So, so the only cost there is the infrastructure to, to bring, bring the energy in and to port the energy back out. And so a, uh, that makes thermal storage more attractive because if you look at the coal plants around the world, which are being phased out, you've got a footprint, you've got electrical infrastructure there, and you generally have enough area around there. If you look at the size of the coal mountains <laughs> and what you would need it for a thermal energy storage of coal and hot tanks, uh, you've got some of the real estate there. So, so that has something going for it. Uh, and uh, so these are all some of the factors that you all have to think about. But in the end, it's how reliable is it going to be? How well can you drive up the temperature differences? And again, always thinking about turning things. It's, uh, there's a term that thermodynamics people use instead of entropy, uh, they use exergy. But it really boils down to if you want to take conversion, think of, you know, it's you want mechanical heat, you've got temperature differences, you don't, so whatever you do, you want to minimize that loss of entropy in every way you can. And that's why these, for example, Brayton turbines are so wonderful. Those many, many fan blades yeah. take things in steps and they adiabatically allow you to compress and expand. Yeah, yeah. So there's a few more questions, I think also related to uh, Paul Alberta's. Maybe mm -hmm. let me uh, bring back Paul and also Will. Let's just go into the panel discussion. I think there's, they're so correlated, all these questions. Uh, one question I have for both of you, certainly Will, feel free to chime in as well. And uh, I look at the choices, right? Come back to this question. There's so many technology choices right there. Uh, Paul, you have this uh, really excellent analysis, right? What's the cost we should think about? You know, if I look at a hundred hours uh, kind of storage, I think you give the number right there. We really want to get down to somewhere per kilowatt hour, you know, $10 type of, of range, right? Uh, $10, $20 around that. Certainly there's, there's some assumption right there. And now looking at the technology choices right there and also the use case, this kind of couple hour storage, four hours, that's lithium ion cover really well. Then you go up to 10, you go up to 
a few days. And if I ask the question, would somebody want to invest for different use case in terms of time, duration, different technology? But could you think about if just one technology can do the job, then you actually, you know, your investment and return is much better, right? Because your use case is you want to have 100 hours. By the same time, it's 100 hours if you already invested the storage, you want to, it to be able to handle, you know, several hours. So how, how do we think about this complex situation, right? There's a different time, sc time scale requirement. This technology have different cost profile. And uh, also, uh, and uh, this use case is not like independent. They are kind of mixed together in terms of hours. So how, how, do, how do we think about this? I don't know who wants to take it. <laughs> I thought you were addressing it to Paul. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe Paul can take it first and then Steve can also come as well. Good question. Uh, so I think most of what's going on out there today is addressing this, like let's say up to 10, 20 hour duration. So a lot of the thermal storage technology, um, flow batteries, mechanical type storage, et cetera, most of this stuff is not going after the 100-hour problem statement. Um, there are a couple that are trying to go after this really long duration problem statement, like over 50, but that's by far not the majority of what's going on. Oftentimes, when people talk about long duration, they're talking about eight or 10. And you know, to me, I think there are a variety of viable approaches. Um, Professor Chu just talked about a number of them that, would, that could fit into that kind of single day type world. Also on this issue, um, what also might happen is that uh, because lithium ion uh, is ramping up so significantly for automotive that you know if someone made a, well, I think what could end up happening is that we end up with a lot of lithium ion on the grid and that's gonna take a big chunk of that intraday, like 10 or 12. And then once that market of daily time shift is largely satisfied, um, then the longer duration, which of course can do shorter durations, won't necessarily have that market around. And so, and I think Andrew Ponick talked about this a little bit in his discussion also, there, is there a separate market for like 10 to 100 or this longer duration type? And, and what would that look like? What kind of attributes might be there? So I think, um, I think there is kind of conceptually and in terms of what the market looks like, there is gonna be a lot of this intraday type work in lithium mine and other technologies for the coming decade or 15 years or and beyond. And so what position does that put this longer duration technologies into? And I think that's an important issue to think through. <clears throat> you know, the, in the free market philosophy of energy storage and energy in general, uh, first comment is, is that most of the energy and energy markets are now being sold as next day energy. <clears throat> and, and as we learned from Texas, not enough thought has been given to building in the resiliency of the system. The idea being that if things get really expensive, then people with, with uh, energy capacity, they, th they can turn up, uh, even though these so-called peaker plants aren't used that much uh, during the times when you really need the energy, they can charge a lot of money for the energy. Uh, that works up to a point uh, because when your 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 energy rates go up by a factor of a thousand, people get very upset. Uh, and not only that, the in the, that economy, those people really don't care if they um, if they run out. And what's a few days of blackout? You know, in the overall scheme of things, well, we learn a few days of blackout uh, can cost lives. So so this is. Again, we have to rethink this. How much of the premium, it used to be in the old days where you had a utility company that's vertically integrated, you had to be responsible for it and, and, they, and the utility commission said, here's a lot of money, you can build capital investments, you can, you can, your rates will be included in the cost of money for those capital investments, this is all great stuff. And so they took a longer term view. That was, we go more to this market economy uh, you're building into the system actually less resiliency, but so does going to more wind and thermal as well. So you've got, you've got these things going towards uh, a kind of a more unstable system. The gas peaker people 
are saying, you know, if I was only gonna be on five or 10% of the time, but I can charge a lot of money for that, I'm still willing to invest in it. And then the question is, you know, the battery people might say that, but you know, what's the ace in the card? Because you're still in this one day stuff. And, and when you have a five day event, and there have been five days or even longer when wind has stopped blowing in, in regions in the United States, or you have these cold winds. Then what happens is then you need some really longer storage. And that's why I spent so much time talking about natural gas. Yeah. <laughs> right? We do not have something at the present time that will get us to the five-day, 10-day storage time, uh, which is kind of magical because once you're in that longer range, uh, as Paul said in his article, uh, you can get to a very high fraction uh, intermittent renewables. Yeah. So, I mean, speaking of energy resilience, I, I asked one more question. Maybe um, Will will also have questions to ask. Coming to the, um, the energy resilience, I mean, it's looking into natural gas, this is amazing, right? It's, it's, uh, Steve, Paul, your, your, your estimation is roughly the same, like 50 days, two months of uh, the whole nation's reserve is right there. Would it be crazy to think about a national reserve for electricity kind of stuff <laughs> right there? This also sort of require the grids to be interconnected somehow. Then once, uh, I think we, it probably become a lot more robust if they can all be interconnected. Then you geographically, solar and wind, you know, this fluctuation in different region of the nation, you kind of balance out that's on one hand. The second one is once you have a number of a reserve lo location, electricity storage, you can kind of support each other a lot more. Would that be crazy to think about national reserve of electricity storage? No, in fact, it's necessary. If you're going to get anywhere above 50% in 75, 80% uh, renewables, uh, other than hydro, you need that. Uh, again, there's resistance. Uh, people who in areas where there's cheap electricity, like Pacific Northwest, actually don't really like cheap electricity leaving their area, uh, even though it's much more, it's much cheaper. When I was Secretary of Energy, I tried to get going even energy balancing as a, as a prelude to this. And all sorts of people hit Congress to say, don't let the secretary do this. <laughs> they do not want long distance transmission. And this actually started when I was LBL director, I was on an energy study called America's Energy Future. And I was talking about a, a DC high voltage backbone grid that can use, you know, you know four time zones and different weather patterns. We're very blessed with different weather patterns. Uh, so the wind can be low in one region, not in another. Europe wind is not like that. It's, it's kind of the same. So we were actually had it good. And I said, this would be great. You know, all the wind uh, from North Dakota to Texas, it's great, it's cheap land. The people love it, you know, they make extra money, but you got to get it to the coast where the people are. Uh, but no one, there was huge resistance to building long distance high voltage transmission lines. Uh, and the average time of siding was 11 years. And I, I said, we got to get this down to three or four years, uh, but I couldn't make it go in. Secretary of uh, Interior, Ken Salazar was very sympathetic to it, but he couldn't make the people in the fish and wildlife game part of his, his, his um, section uh, go along with this because they don't want high voltage transmission lines where they're hunting and fishing. Mm. So, yeah. so it's crazy. Now, um, China doesn't have this much resistance for something like this. <laughs> so they have the best high voltage long distance transmission lines in the world. Yeah, we need some of the top down, you know, to be able to do this. Yeah, China is very well, strong. I prefer still to live in a democracy, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, uh, one interesting point here to look at is if you if you look at, and this is often under the radar, the natural gas transmission system is being significantly expanded, even today. And the EIA publishes on this all the time. So uh, they're like 36 inch diameter pipes. They're buried under the ground. People don't see them. And a single line can carry many gigawatts of chemical energy. People don't even know this is happening. Or it's not nearly as 
widely understood. So I think on this issue of do we need to have a, ne a nationwide or, or some other kind of large scale storage plus transmission, you know, chemical storage, hydrogen, which of course Europe is much more focused on, or even synthetic natural gas, you pay the efficiency penalty. And that's a really important problem, <laughs> or it's, it's, just, it's and it might be unavoidable, especially if you go through combustion at the end. But that is what it looks like. It's like what we have today. And people don't care about putting new chemical transmission lines in. They don't even know they're there. Um, people have this in their backyards and realize it. You know, big 36 inch natural gas transmission pipes. Yeah, maybe transition uh, line, the electricity one can be also buried under the ground. Then. No, no that, that's, that's different because uh, it's limited by the strength of the dielectrics. Yeah. And so where you can get 1.1 megavolt uh, DC lines in the air, they're bare wires. Uh, the highest voltage DC lines are 500 kilovolts. There's experimenting with 600 kilovolts, but it's, it's the loss is V squared over R. So it's a big deal. Uh, the gas pipelines, you know, the, the people have been talking about hydrogen. You can't use the gas pipelines as no. steel and brittlement. So you've got to uh, lay in polymer pipes, but you can maybe use the right of way, which is part of the battle. And, and to install the, the hydrogen, but, but you know, hydrogen has its own issues, but the, the inefficiencies as Paul mentioned, but we're, gonna, we're gonna, gonna have hydrogen and some pipelines in hydrogen for sure, because, because we need all the things. We don't seem to see any magic savior coming in at us. And let's, I still think we should have maximized pump nitro. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, let me let me build off on this a little bit more. Uh, Steve, I know you talked about some of the political challenges with um, improving transmission, but if we only look at it from a technical and economic perspective, right? We are putting huge amount of resources for energy storage, right? Starting with short duration storage for lithium ion battery. If we put that resource into transmission and benchmark that, how does the economics play out? So if I can cross four time zones, then I don't need to have storage um, for the four hours. And does the economics, is it favorable compared to deploying uh, local stationary storage? Well, actually, I, I didn't really do any serious economic analysis. Paul, have you looked at that? Not serious. I think it's a non-starter practically. So I, I haven't looked at that in detail, like how, how much the cost per lot, per mile, uh, yeah. et cetera. It, the, the reason, Paul, I think it's a non-star, is the resistance. I mean, look at look at the, uh, the Northeast of the United States. It's got some of the highest electricity bills outside of Western Alaska and Hawaii. And, you know, Maine through New York, New Jersey. Okay, really high energy costs, okay? Canada's got tons of hydro they love to sell. Cheap, clean hydro. And, uh, and the people who just bought gas generators say, no, we're really stranded assets. So, so what did they do? They got people say, we don't want to see high voltage transmission lines <laughs> in Vermont and New Hampshire and other places. So, so then you have to erode away that, but that's for the first decade or two, that's, that's been the thing. Now they're beginning to think of transmission lines into Canada because Canada's swimming in hydro in Quebec. Uh, and it makes no sense, right? And there was no issue of energy security. The Canadians are more trustworthy than we are. So, <laughs> so I, I think you know we have to start thinking of these these issues, and and transmission is going to be has to be part of it. So one recent example of this is actually a, a, a former RP colleague, Tim Idell, who's now at the Engine MIT, starting a company called Deer, which is focused on using existing transmission corridors. And, and increase the amount of, of, of transmission, the amount of power you can transmit on essentially the existing infrastructure. That type of thing, yes. Yeah. I think uh, more, you know, other stuff. Just again, it's it's just not technical. It's uh, I just I just don't. It just hasn't happened historically, and it's, it's really hard to do that. Yeah, uh, I've been advising Germany over the last half decade or so on on these things. And they have a transmission line issue that sounds it's just start starts putting in DC lines. You know, on a tower that has six lines, put in two DC lines. You can have three times as much power generated from the same wires, two wires. Uh, and because uh, you can go to a higher voltage, uh, you don't have the losses due to radiation and inductive coupling to the ground, all that stuff. Thank you, Steve. Um, let me maybe also ask 
a question about scaling up and, and the cost learning curve. Both of you touch upon this a great deal. And I couldn't help to make the comparison between the cost learning curve of lithium ion batteries versus uh, this more larger scale, you know, chemi chemical energy storage or whatever energy storage on the size of a, a, a power plant or a chemical plant. You know, it, it's quite natural to, to see the difference, right? Lithium ion batteries, we're making billions of them. Uh, we're building many factories a year. We're learning very quickly. Uh, and so the iteration time is short. For the power plant slash chemical plant style energy storage, the learning curve is slower because the project time is much longer. Do you see this as a fundamental difference between a scale up that's done by scaling manufacturing of small devices versus the scale up by making something large and enormous? Um, could you both maybe comment and contrast these two um, fundamentally different cost learning curves? Let me, let me start. That's a great observation and comment and question. Um, and what I see is the only way you can do this is to start to stamp out turbines and things at a standard thing at a much higher volume in a single factory. The pictures I showed you of hydro were one-offs. Okay, you can't do that. Just as the nuclear reactors are built on site with expense costs, you want to go to a small modular reactor where, where you stamp them out of factory by the thousands and you have higher quality control but even the small modulars, they're thinking of doing you, but you still got the rest of the on-site stuff. So the more you can get a deliverable that's made in a factory and the whole thing goes there, the better you are. So, so I started thinking about this and started saying, can you standardize turbines? Can you standardize these generators? Can you standardize them? And you go to these two or three sizes and start mass producing like crazy. And then that's the only way you can, if you start doing one-off turbines, this is crazy. Uh, and, and so that's your only hope. Now, you're never going to get to the car manufacturing, you know, cell phone rapid turnover, because these things are going to last a half a century or more. Uh, well, the motor generator part may be 30 years. Okay, but, but, but so you go to mass production and high volume. Thank you, Stephen. Maybe also the aerospace industry might be a sort of a middle ground for comparison as well in terms of medium volume manufacturing. Paul, any thoughts? Yeah, there is a, a fundamental difference there. And I, I kind of tried to provide a little bit of numbers in the history of lithium ion there and what it took. Um, you know, one, obviously lithium ion, something like this, this is a new chemistry, right? And it, it sounds like it's just one thing, but there was a lot of different pieces and new development. It's, it's something truly new, right? Some of the thermal storage technologies, they're still using turbines. As Professor Chu mentioned, there's a whole bunch of different configurations and things like this, but there is a bit of a shelf there that there's more stuff on compared to something like lithium ion. So I think that makes them a, a bit more comparable, but um, being able to start small, get to you know try things out, do the learning curve, that's that's very important. Um, one other comment I'll make is <laughs> who's buying it, right? <laughs> like, where's the pull? So we can do all this stuff and talk about pushing stuff out there, but someone's got to buy it. Um, and I think there's still that issue too, is that who's going to sign up for 10 years and tens of billions of dollars of purchasing grid storage products? If that is there and secure, that does change a lot of investors' calculations. And some of these things kind of happen automatically, or not automatically, but they happen because people see that there's a market that, that you can go into. And so that would, that would create a lot of activity that I think it's going to be hard, even if we have ideas like standardization and stuff on the, on the technology side, without that pull, it's really going to be a a challenge to get things to happen. Absolutely, Paul. E, would you like to wrap us up? We're at the end of the hour. Yeah, I, I think you should go ahead and then also uh, advertising for the next event as well, yeah. Sure, well, Stephen, Paul, do you wanna sort of share a, a one minute outlook? You know, we talked about a lot about challenges and opportunities. So uh, maybe you can uh, say a couple of words on what is to come. Well, I'll begin. I think energy storage and transmission are, and the integration are the key issues facing us now. You know, the learning curves of wind and solar are great. They can, can continue. Uh, on the transmission side, we need, I'd love to have a diamond, an efficient diamond transistor. So you can get DC, you go up and down uh, and, and tap off in many places instead of just, you know, one stop. Um, uh, the, uh, there may be some few more tricks. So if you think of the evolution of the 
Braden turban and how it got better and better and better. It's kind of amazing <laughs> what they're doing, but, but it was different because it wasn't for a, a commercial airplane where, where a few percent made a lot. That was the market pull. Uh, and I don't think we have, as Paul said, that market pull in some of this stuff yet. Um, yeah, I, I think I'd echo, this is an important topic. And I, I really do think that if we think about the suite of things that can be done to do decarbonization, that wind solar storage, that's really important. Um, and uh, having read thousands probably of proposals as an RP program director, there's a lot of good ideas out there. We've seen a lot of companies in the symposium series and others who have not presented here. There's a lot of excited technologists who are working on this, on this problem. Um, and I think I just echo again, something I, I tried to comment and, and, and Professor Chu also mentioned is that, where's the market pull on this? And, and the mandates are just, uh, state mandates are tiny. And so I think that that is a kind of missing piece of this as much as we love, and I love talking about storage science and technology that um, there's still a, something at the other side of this that's, that's, that's still, I think, missing and uh, is worth thinking carefully about and seeing, seeing what can be done there. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Steve. And on that note, I'm. Uh, uh, let's wrap the symposium, Bob. So thank you both, uh, again, Steve and Paul, for a very insightful discussion today. I, I learned a lot. And we have more to come. So the spring lineup uh, is shown on the screen here. Uh, we have a lot of great speakers, very diverse from different uh, part of the innovation pipeline, as well as sector. Uh, next, uh, in two weeks, we have a session on new aqueous uh, chemistry from Cheng Sheng Wang, also from the University of Maryland, Yi Ching Liu from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, two weeks after, we're gonna have Tim Holm, the CTO and co-founder of QuantumScape, and Jennifer Root from MIT speak about solid state batteries. And after that, we're gonna have a session with uh, Diane uh, Grunich, uh, who is uh, formerly the commissioner of CUPC to talk about building energy efficiency and energy storage. Then we're gonna have Frank Blum, who is the head of battery um, at Volkswagen, which has just announced a major initiative in EVs. And then to wrap up the quarter, we're gonna hear from Yankuk Sun and Huber Gasteggers on the latest uh, chemistry developments for lithium ion battery cathodes. So I hope you will mark your calendars and uh, join us in these coming sessions. Thank you everyone and have a great day.